Welcome to the Cross Border Interview is the online show where we dive into the insights of municipal political leaders from coast to coast to coast here in beautiful Canada. Now, our mission is quite simple on this show. It is to shine a light on the dedicated individuals who day in and day out work around the council table to shape their communities that we call home. Joining us for today's episode is City of St. Albert, Alberta Councillor Ken Mackay. St. Albert celebrates a rich history that dates back over 150 years and has often been called Alberta's finest city. Founded in 1861 by Father Albert Lacombe, St. Albert is the oldest non-fortified community within Alberta. The City of St. Albert is proud of its community and all that it has to offer. With its picturesque landscape, outstanding parks and trails, state-of-the-art recreational facilities, robust arts and culture community, and countless amenities, this city has it all. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs and they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today and doing this interview. I want to start by getting the first question, which I traditionally ask on this show right off the bat, mm -hmm. out of the way. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Councillor? Yeah, well, thank you very much for the invitation, Chris. I, I've watched a few of your other interviews and I've always been interested in the in hearing what uh, other councillors and other elected officials have heard all, not only in Alberta, but all across, certainly Western Canada and even in Ontario. So uh, always very interesting. And it's always uh, one of the takeaways that I have from your interviews is realizing how similar all of our issues are around the municipal level. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, this one is an easy question for me. Yeah, um, my background actually comes from policing. I was a police officer for 34 years in the city of Edmonton. And uh, I always believe strongly that uh, we get the community that either we tolerate or that we're willing to build. And so I saw that quite often in my policing career and you saw how dysfunction actually eats away a community. And I certainly didn't want to have that happen in the place that I called home and I lived in. <laughs> when we moved out to St. Albert uh, back in 1989, I was quick to start to look at opportunities where I could get engaged with the community whether it was in uh, a number of volunteer opportunities within the food bank or within sporting events when I was coaching my son. Or, you know, as you moved up, I started getting involved in uh, city communities, uh, community like the Community Service Advisory Board at the time. Um, and then it just moved up into other community, no, pardon me, committees that I became involved with. So for me, I was always thinking that it was going to be what was the whether or not that was going to be the next step but career got in my way and uh when the opportunity uh did arrive i thought you know what i'm going to uh put my name forward and really the hardest part about putting your name forward is when you come from a team environment you have to switch from we to i for that job interview for that very short period of the job interview and then go back to we again so for me, who's always either been involved in teams or in team building, the I was always very difficult to get out because when you're putting your name forward, you want the community to know who you are and what your values are. But that wasn't the hard part. It was I instead of we. So I did a little <laughs> bit of research on you prior to this interview, and I, I looked at your resume and your background through the biographies and all the social media posts that you've mm -hmm. done. 
it seems from an outsider's perspective, your trajectory in politics would not have traditionally been in the municipal realm. Mm. It would have been provincially or even federally with your policing background, with your work with the children and youth. But you chose mm -hmm. municipally in 2017 around that community aspect that you talked about in that first uh, question. What was it about that municipal allure, that aura of mm -hmm. municipal municipal politics that drew you to it can, rather than the other two levels? It's actually a simple response. It was just basically we're the closest to the people. It was where I thought I could have the biggest impact. And I wasn't being directed by a party whip or by a philosophy or an ideological bent. I can look at what the issues are and then make the best decision what I feel best for the community rather than what's best for the party. It was easy. It was an easy decision for me to stay focused on uh, municipal politics. Um, you know, you go in with an open mind, not an empty mind. I know that's a canned phrase a lot of the times, but that's truly the truth. Uh, this op this gives me an opportunity to look at what the main issues are, <clears throat> what some of the underlying facts, and really look at uh, what's best for the community as a whole. So we're coming up to about seven years of you being in elected office now. I want to go back Scary. to I, <laughs> the year from now is going to be an election. It's weird. Yeah, it seems like, just very... two, it seems like last year we were talking about the last uh, 2021 municipal election. But seven years ago, what was going on in your life that you said, OK, mm -hmm. now it's Ken's time? Because you could have waited. You could have waited till 2021 mm -hmm. to put your name on the ballot. There was a by-election in 2015 in St. Albert. You could have put your name on the ballot then. Mm -hmm. What specifically drew you and said, okay, 2017, it's my time. It's time for Ken to become, go from we to I. <laughs> it was, uh, it really just was around the circumstances around employment. Like I said, I had a 34-year career, or 40, 34 year career with the Emerson Police Service. Uh, with in a lot of different responsibilities uh, in relation to that. And it was around working with the community. I was one of the very first uh, um, members of the police service to work with a community services worker around the issue of domestic violence. So that really got me into some of the uh, main uh, fundamental issues around what are the drivers behind um, domestic violence. Then I started working with youth uh, within the police service and that really spurred my interest in working with the child and youth advocate within the uh, province of Alberta. And that really kept me in relation to some of the issues that were going around there. But that was, that was my career. And as my career was starting to wind down, even with the child and youth advocate, um, just happened to coincide very closely with the 2017 election. So I was able to actually look at what was going on in the community. And at that particular time, there was there was a little bit of discourse in the community in relation to a number of different issues. And um, I thought, you know what, this is, I'm winding down my second career, my second retirement. And uh, it said, you know what, let's put my name forward and uh, run for a counselor and actually start to see if I can implement some of my experience and some of my, um, uh, you know, background into actually making a, a city council work more, better and work together as a team and, uh, um, you know, give back to my community in that, in that manner. Has it been what you expected looking back in 2017, what you expected the role of a counselor to be looking back mm -hmm. now, seven years later, has it been what you expected? Yes. I, I pretty well knew what a role of a counselor was from all my experience, both in municipal policing, plus also, uh, being involved with all of the community work that I had done and some of the uh, task forces that I'd been involved with, with, uh, with city and city council. So, and I knew a lot of the city councillors uh, in other roles, whether it was either in policing or whether it was as their representatives on my committees uh, within the city. So, yeah, you know what, I was not in for any big surprises uh, or anything like that. I know, I know that's one of your questions that you ask. And I know some councillors, when they walk in, they say, wow, it's nowhere near what I expected, but that wasn't so, the way for me. So then on the flip side of that, what did, because we're, like I, we kind of jokingly mentioned it already, we're a year yeah. away from the next municipal election here in the province of Alberta. 
what advice would you give the next crop of candidates who are about to put their mm -hmm. name on the ballot? Is there something that you wish you would have known or had instilled upon you prior to that? Or because like you said, you sort of knew it. Is there something that you mm -hmm. would want to pass on to a potential yeah. candidate who's saying, I might want to put my name forward, not even in St. Albert, yeah. but across the province? No, I, it's a good question. And I think it's one of the things that have been missing in actually some of the orientation around uh, what, what happens when you are a counselor. I think that orientation should start when you want to become a counselor, get involved in your community. You should have already perhaps been involved in your community. I'm not going to make any value statements. I'm thinking that there's, uh, but that's what worked for me. And I got to know the community. I got to know the issues surrounding the community. I got to know what the processes were. So, because in most uh, elections, uh, particularly in Alberta, the first big issue after the uh, when you're elected in October, you're right into budget and you're right into municipal budgets. And if you're not understanding what municipal budgets entail, then what I think you need to do is start to educate yourself er earlier. So there's almost needs to be a pre-orientation period. And I, you know, and I honestly believe that if we were looking at some of the things that are happening around Bill 20, that maybe needs to be something where uh, they could build in the actually orientation. And I think maybe there is that ability now because you have to identify or you can actually start running. Uh, you know, the regulations aren't out yet and it's not really too clear, but potentially there's an opportunity to say, if you're going to be running for a council or if you're thinking you're going to be running for a council or a mayor and a municipal board, it might be an idea to really be informed and and maybe it's up to the municipality to start to offer those a little earlier in the process. I, I know in St. Albert, we did have a uh, an orientation um, uh, opportunity put on by our uh, legislative officers to say, here's what to expect. Uh, here's your meeting schedules. Here's kind of what some of the background material is. Here's your agenda packages so that you're not going to go in uh, and go, wow, this is not what I expected. I, and I'm not saying that that's it for everyone, but that's uh, that's what works for our, that what worked for me anyways. But on the flip side of that, a package can only take you a certain amount of the way. I've done mm -hmm. enough of these interviews now that I've come to the realization, and I hate to uh, paint a broad stroke here, but the day-to-day -day job of a counselor is not something that you can ever prepare for because you have to make mm -hmm. some very tough choices around that decision, that table. And that means, and I'm assuming after seven years and 34 years as a police officer, mm -hmm. you've come to the realization, not everyone's going to agree with you on everything you vote for or vote against. Mm -hmm. How do you prepare yourself to make the best decisions at that council table with the information provided by administration yeah. and what's gathered from the public that you've gone out and actually asked people about. Yeah. And that, that's an excellent question because I think that's something that everybody approaches a little bit different. And, but my background, because I moved up through progressively uh, responsible leadership uh, positions and some of the issues that you deal with around policing um, uh, are very similar in what you deal with as a municipal counselor. And so you do have to have, I, so I developed very early in my career an ethical decision-making framework, and I still stick to that very much to not only in my um, business life as a counselor, but also in my personal life. And so it's really around getting as much information, getting the facts around um, as much information as of the issue, um, kind of identifying those ones that are more of a ethical background, uh, looking at um, uh, whether or not, uh, uh, you know, these things, how, how this actually measures against my personal mo morals and values, and uh, developing um, uh, a kind of that, using that framework to look at what are the all of the facts, like I've said before, dealing with what are some of the alternative uh, options, um, what are, what kind of lens do I look through it, and then choosing an option, testing it in my own mind anyways, and and kind of floating out a few, uh, uh, well, what about this? What about that? And then um, basically implementing a decision and willing to stay, stay with your decision because it's what I believe is best uh, for the in community as a whole. And I, I think that's always. Can I challenge those... you on that for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I, because I, I, I... I appreciate that you have ethics and I think everyone in that in the, the <laughs> position of counselors and mayors should have ethics and should stick yeah. to them. 
how right. do you hold your ethics up against what the community wants? Because you are there to represent the community. Yeah. And if you, if the majority of the community says, Ken, we don't want this. And you say, well, my right. ethics says that we should have it because it's it will be good for the community. Is there a balancing act that you have to walk through or does the ethical side of Ken always win? Uh, well, I I don't even think that's even the, you know, I'm going to challenge you back. Um, I don't think that, I mean, honestly, if I think if the majority of the, the community believes that that's what it is, you're, you're there to represent the majority of the community and, uh, and make sure that they all have all of the, all of the information and the facts that you have. And I know real, and I realize that that's challenging because I think that's one of the biggest challenges a counselor has, because we actually have access to information that, honestly citizens don't have or don't want to have and and then what you have to always have to do is say uh i mean it's right now for example we're we're in a big kind of discussion as it relates to how do we best communicate because um you know you always have that individual saying well i didn't know that you were going to change the zoning in relation to that particular uh asp so um how do we get that information out so um you know, if 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 it ever did come to where the majority of the community said we don't want this, then I have to listen to the community. That doesn't go against my ethics. That that doesn't go against uh, that. I mean, that's part of my uh, uh, decision making framework that I've developed in relation to, um, you know, how do I, how do I make it? Unless it's illegal, of course, right. <laughs> I mean, that's, true. that's, I mean, I mean, obviously if it's illegal, I'm, 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 I'm no matter what it is, you're not too for it. No, no. So, I mean, I mean, that's, so, I mean, it, it's really, it's what's, um, it, I mean, if it's un, if there's an uneven benefit, then, I mean, it's, that's where your challenge is going to be. So, I mean, I, I think if you, you know, to use your, if the majority, then I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna obviously say you know what the majority is, and so there's obviously gonna have to be something in there that tilts that majority that way, and it's something that either if I've missed it, then I've got to go back and look for that. Uh, but um, if if I honestly believe that it's in the best interest of the community, it's my job to make sure that I get that information out so that that the community understands where that decision is coming from. And I would say that majority of the community would probably say, okay, now that I have that information, I agree with you. You talk about engagement and it's one thing that I, I, I have found <laughs> and even in, in my time, even as a municipal employee at, during it, yeah. while I was working for administration, engagement is the hardest part of any municipal municipality's yeah. job, getting out there and actually engaging. Do you find that when you go out, and I'm saying you as the individual counselor, when you go out asking mm -hmm. for, for for feedback on certain things, do you get the responses that you're looking for? Or do you have to sort of pry it like a dentist and pull the teeth a little bit to try to get the feedback you're looking for? No, well, you know what? It depends on the issue, right? I mean, obviously, I think that's really the, the big issue. I mean, uh, there are many people that are <clears throat> uh, don't really have any uh, you know any anything in the game in relation to what they're going to win or lose out of that thing so they're they're, they're really not informed um but there are a lot of is issues where um uh people are more than willing to talk and give their opinion and i respect that because i mean obviously uh they're they may be more impacted by that than another uh, another member in the community so you know it's it's like i mentioned the engagement and that's what i said it's really it, it is a challenge because there's um, so much social media that uh, is out there. And are we actually uh, helping with the social media? Are we getting our information out? I mean, the traditional tools that were in the MGA, where there was, you know, the 100 meters to notification, well, that doesn't necessarily uh, work as, 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 as it did many years ago when, when that was put into the MGA. So um, do, do we need to actually look at how, do, how does that, impacts somebody else that may be living outside that 100 meters if if that's the issue that we're talking about um it's uh where do you get your sources from i mean as you know as now in your media role <clears throat> traditional uh newspapers are are facing challenges all across canada and probably all over the world so how do how do how do you get the information to the people so that at least you can say it was out there uh, and if you can if you want it you can go get it
So it is it is a challenge, and I'm sure it's a challenge. And I'm listening to your interviews like I did in my research. I think it's a challenge wherever you are in this in this it, country. Or it certainly is. There's some people that you actually have to like literally hand it to them to, for them to actually yeah. say, Oh yes, I finally got it. Even then there's gonna be that one person says, I didn't get it. Well, I handed it to you. You have to read it. We only yeah. can go 99% yeah. of the way. Anyway, yeah. on that note, engagement yeah. is one aspect of the job. Yeah. But understanding the role and responsibilities and the jurisdictional purview of the municipality is another. Um, I would say since COVID-19, which you kind of were at the beginning and now at the mm -hmm. end of COVID-19, you have probably seen a change in understanding of what the role the municipality plays in the general public. I could be wrong in St. Albert, but uh, mm. after doing this these conversations for some time, I have come to the realization that there is a blurring of jurisdictional roles. Do you get a sense in St. Albert that people understand that the municipality has a role to play, the province has a role to play, and the federal government has a role to play? Or are you finding people coming up to you and saying, we need to talk about healthcare, we need to talk about education? Oh. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know whether it's even so much to blurring. I think there's a there's um, I mean, if you talk to your MP, uh, a lot of times when they say they go door knocking, they'll say people want to talk about garbage collection when I knock on the door. They don't want to talk about what's happening in Ottawa. They want to talk about why their garbage didn't get picked up or why the tree on the boulevard had to be cut down. And, and so, I mean, they're seeing it on that end in relation to the kind of a uh, of a crossing the lines into into that i mean i know that was a, a little bit of a different uh, uh but, it, analogy. but it's but but it's it, it, and i apologize to interrupt uh no, no, no please but it it gets to the point that people as long as there's a politician in front of their faces they don't care what level you are they want their right. issues addressed how right. do you tell people it's not your issue without telling them it's not your issue because if they see you at the grocery store, I'm assuming they're yeah. going to hit you with a gambit of issues. And sometimes you're going to have to go talk to the MLA or MP about what yeah. those issues are. Yeah. And it's a, it's relationship building with that level of government too. And fortunately in, in St. Albert, we're, we're very uh, connected with our MLAs representing our community and our MP that's representing our community. So that's quite easy for me anyways, as an individual counselor. And I think it's in, it's uh, as an entirety in relation to council, we actually have good working relationships with our MLAs and all that. So if those issues do come forward, we can actually either get a hold of them informally or formally but you know to go back to your original question of course you know what I, and this goes back to my policing career because i mean there's no real simple black and white right i mean in the sense of you know you know what are the drivers in relation to crime and what the issues are in relation to your to your community and and so you do have you do have the same kind of issues where you say you know what, I have to deal with housing, I have to deal with addiction, I have to deal with things that are outside, but I have to recognize that there is a, there is a, uh, a line in the sense of uh, saying, well, that's a health issue, so therefore it's a province, provincial issue. Well, that's a safety and security issue, so that could be either a, uh, uh, a federal issue if it relates to changing a particular uh, statue in the criminal code as it relates to you know, some some issue, or uh, if it relates to uh, what safety and security op opportunities are provided uh, at a provincial level, whether, you know, moving into like provincial policing and or maybe it's a safety and security issues that relates to your neighborhood and you as a community, you're responsible for delivering policing services. So how do we best uh, deal with policing services? So um, there there just has to be that interconnectedness. There has to be that blurring because I mean, that's what actually makes up communities uh, safer. Uh, because if there has to be a willingness to work within what, uh, what you have ability to deal with versus what you know the province has to deal with and how best to engage with the province and how best to engage with your federal representative as well. So really, even though you're saying uh, this is a municipal issue, you have to be prepared to advocate and be able to work with your MLA and your MP in relation to dealing with, uh, you know, how how does this impact them too going forward? Because I, they need to be informed as to what's happening down at my, our level as well. Um, and so, you know, you know, it 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 becomes really political when you're looking at the bigger cities and the bigger cities' issues and challenges and problems. 
uh, at our community, uh, even though we're mid-size, and by the way, we've just had our census and we've actually seen a 9% growth in six years. We're over 72,000 people now, residents. Um, and so uh, we are starting to, to, uh, to move up that scale, but also being a, uh, right on the borders with Edmonton, a very large community, we also see some of the impacts in relation to some of the challenges they're facing. So, um, you know, I think that I think that there has to be an understanding and a willingness that you need to be involved with those issues as well, because they impact the residents and the and the community makeup as a whole. I wasn't going to ask you this question, but you mentioned it, and I want to play in the sandbox for a little bit. You're right. Yeah. Saint yeah. Saint Albert and Edmonton butt up against each other, and. You two are two separate entities. You're two separate cities. But I don't like your fists. No, sorry. <laughs> sorry. For those who are not watching this, I was basically uh, doing uh, just having two fists beside each other. But you are two separate entities. Okay. But often you get lumped in together. Mm -hmm. From an outsider's perspective, do you feel like you often don't get your fair share? And I know this is asking a counselor this question, and it's your opinion, but do you feel mm -hmm. like St. Albert's issues are separate from Edmonton issues, or are they greater Edmonton area issues now? Because that's how, mm -hmm. when most provincial or federal politicians talk, that's how they talk about issues that are going on in Edmonton and area. No, I mean, we're definitely separate entities and we have our, our separate issues. But I mean, obviously, a majority of our residents that are employed work within Edmonton or work with around uh, institutions or educational institutions or other uh, government institutions in, in the in the region. So we're we're, uh, we're definitely influenced by what goes on in Edmonton because of our close proximity, but we're separate entities. But we also, <laughs> as, as you're very familiar and you've talked to many uh, other councillors were part of a much bigger region, the Edmonton Metro Region Board, and that's uh, 12 municipalities that are 13 municipalities that are uh, surrounding Edmonton. And we're all dealing with some of the growth issues and some of the challenges that live that are associated to uh, living next to a big uh, metropolitan area that is only growing uh, every year. And, and we're growing as we're growing. Uh, Spruce Grove's growing, Stony Plain's growing, Leduc's growing, Beaumont is growing. I mean, and we're all dealing with growth issues. So, uh, I mean, that goes back to your previous question as to how the the blurring. Uh, we're all we're all growing, and how do we work together in relation to providing the services that that residents require? So with that answer, I kind of expect to know what the next answer is going to be with my question, but I have to pre preface this question with this. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. It's not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not even a policy of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion and his opinion alone. It may line up with what's going on at council, but it's his opinion. Mm -hmm. That being said, if you have any emails, please send them to me and I will file them away in the appropriate locations as I always do. <laughs> so, counselor, in your opinion, what right. do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the city of St. Albert today as of recording this in early September of 2024? Right. Yeah, you know what? And not surprisingly, they're very similar to what's going on. Uh, it's around affordability, it's around providing services, um, it's around managing that growth that I was just talking to. I mean, some of the challenges we have right now um, are uh, dealing with aging infrastructure, dealing with new infrastructure. Um, so uh, to be specific in relation to that last point, um, you know, servicing. Uh, some of our new growth areas needs uh, significant uh servicing uh and if we don't provide that servicing we don't manage we don't have growth and uh, and uh, some people will say well that's good we need to make sure that we have <laughs> we start to cap growth but that's not in my opinion that's not realistic i mean we have more and more people well we have more and more people that are coming into our into our community and uh, we need to be able to provide that services so that we can actually get the growth. So for we we have a very large um, uh, servicing area that uh, is going to uh, require uh, underground services, and that's going to be 
you know, right up around $65 million. So, uh, but some of that is leviable. So we'll be able to get uh, that, that, that do those dollars back. But at the same time, um, you're going to need that servicing so that you can pro provide the growth and also deal with some of the existing aging infrastructure, because it's not one or the other, it's they, they tie into each other. So, uh, you know, the, the housing issue for St. Albert has been, you know, uh, even with that growth, we've managed to actually do fairly well in relation to uh, diversifying our growth. I mean, that was always one of the um, strategic priorities of this council. And one of my personal priorities was around how do we diversify the different types of housing in, in our community? Because we've always been previous when I moved into it, it was always you know big homes on big lots and that was very attractive probably back in the 70s and 80s when I moved into the community but now um, in order to make sure that we uh, attract new residents and keep residents that we have uh, like you know my my son that wants to maybe move back into the community we had to build that uh, diversity in our housing and I think we've been very successful at doing that. Uh, and then there's really the same issues that are affecting our, we have social issues. We, even St. Albert has a small homelessness process, uh, um, problem. And it's not a problem in the sense that it looks like what Edmonton looks like. It looks like, uh, you know, around our youth, around not being able to, um, um, you know, the houselessness looks a lot different for youth than it does for somebody living on the street. But we do have our challenges and, uh, and we, have to try to buy uh, build that that social network that's available for all our residents. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack on that question, and I said yeah, I sorry. was I I knew what you were going to say. I did. I I take that back because I thought you were going to go down another route and talk about infrastructure, right. but you kind of did. But you yeah. talked about a little bit more in depth, and I want to uh, pick out a few of these if you don't mind. Yeah, I want no, to start. Do. I want to start with the affordability crisis, right? Because, yeah. and I say crisis because it's not just a municipal issue; it's a provincial issue, it's a federal right. issue, it's a Canadian-wide right. issue. It's not just in St. Albert; it's all across this country. How do you, as council, and I, I'm talking about the royal you as the entire council, because you work alongside mm -hmm. that we team? How do you address the affordability crisis? when you're trying to grow the community in a sustainable way, because you can't do it on the backs of the people who are already there because some of them are suffering and you don't want to lead them yeah. to go into, uh, to go homeless. So you have to do it in a sustainable way. Do you find that you as council have stricken a good balance in being able to grow the community while not doing it completely on the backs of the people, whether it be through levies, whether it be through debentures? Yeah, you know, absolutely. In the sense that we totally have changed our land use by law to allow that, you know, and I don't want to start using phrases all the time, but it's that missing middle in relation to what homes look like in our community. We've uh, in, in allowed uh, for uh, different types of housing to be built in different parts of our community that wasn't there available before, whether it was simple things like uh, zero lot lines or simple things like adding lanes property. So we've, uh, and that has allowed builders to build a different product that actually uh, addresses some of the affordability issues. Um, we've, as a, as a council, we've actually stepped up and worked with our housing authority in relation to trying to identify a parcel of land where we're actually going to be able to build an affordable housing. Uh, you know, not right now our housing authority mainly deals with seniors housing in our community anyways, although they've stepped out in other communities uh, that are affiliated um, around providing apartment living. But now we've actually, uh, donated a section of a land in our downtown area and we've actually supplemented it recently in relation to adding more dollars to make it more attractive to get federal dollars that will actually will hopefully uh, lead to um, us building affordable housing in our downtown. We've always had a commitment to um, looking at opportunities to provide a mix of housing and particularly around keeping uh, housing affordable, um, but this is really what, one of our first real efforts in our downtown community in relation to um, trying to build uh, affordable housing using uh, our housing authority and federal dollars. So 
Uh, those are just some examples, um, but we've we've we're working hard on trying to kind of diversify our housing stock, but also allow for uh, a, a, a good you know if you want to if you want a single a uh, large home on a on a lot we have those available still, but at the same time we are actually looking at how do we build and uh, more affordable housing and whether that's apartment buildings or whether that's uh, you know, lane product or zero lot lines. So I, I think that's where we're actually starting to see a little bit of success. You talked about the chicken and the egg a little bit as well, <laughs> bringing the yeah. services in to get the housing. Um, you, you kind of dropped a bomb and I kind of let it slide and I shouldn't have, but you said you just completed the survey, uh, census, I should say, and that's the yeah. city of St. Albert and 9% growth. 9% growth right. is a substantial growth. Um can the city of St. Albert keep the growth sustainable? Because that seems like a large yeah. jump, if you ask me. 9% is not something you can just turn a blind eye to. It's a large number. And no. when you're talking about housing, you're talking about service levels that you have to provide. You're heading into a budget yeah. season. Is it going to be tough? Yeah. You know, it is. I mean, and and you're right, 9%. I mean, it's not what some of our, I mean, our, like look at Beaumont on our on southern borders. I mean, I think they're experiencing even uh, a bigger growth, and and so um, and I, I'm aware of uh, other communities in 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 and around Calgary like Cochrane that are experiencing big growth, and I think that is a challenge, and and it goes to some of the conversation that I you know some of the examples that I used in relation to supporting mixed housing uh, uh, choices, um, and yeah, it is it is. It's not even a bomb. It's a realization in the sense that, yeah, with growth comes challenges as it relates to providing the services. But I, I believe St. Albert's done a really good job in relation to uh, managing that growth. And our housing actually stock has kept pace with that growth. So, it, you know, we don't have, um, you know, we have uh, the housing that's available. The challenge right now is to get the servicing in the ground in time so that that housing is or that those services are provided so um i think it's it is a it is a challenge in our in our in our community i mean some of the uh, there's a lot of individuals that are pardon me there's a lot of uh families and individuals that want to move into uh our community and communities are surrounding edmonton so we're all facing all facing that uh, uh growth issues i mean it's part of the provincial uh uh, program to attract uh, uh, people into our uh, into our province, uh, but yeah, it, it is a challenge, and it's a uh, it's something that we've recognized in our strategic planning, and it it is identified in our budget. You talked about four very big macro issues when you talked about the challenges <laughs> and the issues, affordability, housing, diversification, yeah. and social issues. Now, I was just up in St. Albert earlier this summer and actually earlier this year as well. I've been there twice this year and I'll be back there wow. later on this year uh, in about a few weeks, actually. Um, and I had the pleasure of speaking to some of the people in St. Albert about some of the challenges that they perceive. Mm -hmm. And some of them lined up, but there were some macro issues as well. And it was the middle of mm -hmm. winter when I first talked to this first person. They were talking about the snow removal, which, of course, is always going to be a big issue in the winter. Then they talked about potholes. They talked about health care. How do you, as counselor and as council, balance the macro issues you talk about with the micro issues that people feel passionate about? Because there must be a balance you have to strike to make sure that people feel like their tax dollars are being spent in an appropriate way on the issues that they feel important, whether it be more service levels at the library, uh, potholes in front of my mm -hmm. house need to be fixed, a sidewalk needs to be repaired, or a sidewalk needs to be installed. Is there a balance that you have to strike, or do you look at everything through a lens of what's in the best interest of St. Albert, not just what's in the best interest of the individual? Uh, there's always a balance. I mean, um, there's always a balance and there's always, a, there's always those kind of really right down to the nitty gritty kind of comments and real questions in relation to it. I mean, I, I, we spend a lot of money in our, uh, in our uh, snow budget. And uh, I think when you talk to majority of the people that move into our community, they all say, wow, I didn't real I didn't realize 
how uh, how how bad my services were in my previous community until I actually moved into St. Albert and uh, I got my uh, streets cleaned uh, earlier than it's ever happened before. And then you have on the reverse side of that, you go, well, why are you cleaning my streets so often? Because you don't really need to. Um, and yeah, a, a potholes is a that's going to be the universal issue and the challenge for everybody. And you just have to be able to connect them to interrelation to the servicing. And, and really those are administrative issues and that hopefully that, you know, you get a response from that. So you, you've always going to have that macro. And I think you always have to think about what's best for this, uh, you know, going way back to your first question, you're always going to have to um, work for the, what's best for the community over the long term, not over the, what's the, the the um, short term because you know we really you, you got to foster development all over St. Albert whether it's mature neighborhoods or whether it's building affordability into new development um, so um, yeah you, you know you you you're gonna have to have develop your mechanisms as to how do you deal with those day to day issues and challenges but also you need to you have your strategic priority priorities and your corporate business plan that I then moves over and deals with the macro issues. Uh, I'm just cautious of time here, and I want to just uh, oh, flip the script sorry. a little bit here. No, no, that's my fault. We got a little side <laughs> tangent with some of my questions I wasn't expecting, but I'm glad you answered them. I want to flip the script a little bit because uh, I was accused earlier on in last season about only talking about negative things that come along with the community. <laughs> so I'm gonna I gotta sort of throw a reverse question to my original question, and that is, what's the thing that Saint Albert does? From a councillor's perspective, when you go to talk to other municipal leaders mm -hmm. at Alberta municipalities, which is coming up here in Red Deer in a few weeks by the time this airs, what is the thing that you look at and you say, you know what, we got our challenges, which every community does, mm -hmm. but we're doing this right. What is that thing for you? You know, it's the same, same thing that attracted me to this community way back in 1989. You know, we're... You know, you always have that saying we're a we're a mid city city, but we have a small town feel, and we we're always friendly. We're inclusive. Um, there's a really strong sense of uh, belonging. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that somebody said to me, you know, is, is yeah, you know what, my I've lived in my neighborhood. I now know my I know I got to know my neighbors. I know their children, but now I got to know their grandchildren. So. Uh, I, I, it, I don't, it really starts with learning to uh, develop what your community is, it's what you're willing to, um, uh, to build. And, and so I think, I think what really, it just provides, St. Albert has always provided an outstanding quality of life, where we feel secure. Um, and we, we have access to everything that uh, we need in our community. So um, whether it's that small town, big town feel, uh, or it's uh, just dealing with, um, uh, well, I mean, for me, one of the biggest, biggest attractions is just the fact that uh, we have uh, a real uh, expanse of trails and natural areas. I mean, we have the Red Willow Trail system that's 100 kilometers, uh, and we can get. I can step outside my door and be within two minutes of a trail system that takes me into the river valley or takes me through trees, and you, you don't honestly think that you're in a city. So those are those are things that I think that the uh, not only our community recognizes but the region recognizes, and it's a people say, "Boy, I, when when you come to St. Albert, what do you see?" Uh, let, me, let me flip the question back on you <laughs> when you come into St. Albert. I see a bustling uh, downtown core. I, oh, really? The the three or four times that I was down there, right. and, the, and that's in the lot this year just alone, I honestly saw people actually excited to be downtown. Mm -hmm. Like traditionally, mm -hmm. you might see a, a city there more on the outskirts or in the industrial mm -hmm. or in the commercial zones. But people were enjoying downtown. I was like, okay. And they were walking along well, the downtown pathway. And that was in yeah. the middle of like April. And the last, yeah. and then I want to say just before the Canada Day long weekend when I was last yeah. up there. So it was the time when people could have been during school hours, but it seemed right. like people wanted to be downtown. And I was like, okay, 
St. Albert's doing something right. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, hey, that's great. I know that's one of our strategic priorities is to uh, is to develop our downtown and bring people back downtown. I mean, we have a very traditional downtown, but it's but you're right. We have those kind of new retail it's off centers the beaten that are path, right. It's yeah. off the beaten yeah. path because you yeah. don't traditionally think that the down, like you would assume that it's the main street that goes through the yeah. corridor, but yeah. no, it's off the beaten path. And it's a nice downtown. I'll say that. It's probably yeah. one of the nicest well, that I've seen. <laughs> and, you know, and during, and <laughs> well, that's nice to hear because I think that's one of the, what we're trying to do. I mean, I think it's even to some of our residents, it's not well known. Um, and I know for years we had a downtown area revitalization plan, DARP, and I think that there's critics of that too, but uh, we're, we're really trying to uh, revitalize that. And, and certainly on Saturdays between June and October, we have the largest outdoor market that brings, depending on what day it is, between 15 and 25,000 people on a Saturday to downtown St. Albert. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's one of the biggest attractions that we've got. And uh it's uh, it's an incredible it's an incredible vibe in our downtown area during market day. It certainly is. Um, I want to turn to something you've already started talking about, but I'm going to ask a little bit more in depth, and I'm going to ask sort of a Sophie's Choice question. There is an abundance of tourist destination spots within yeah. St. Albert. You are a vibrant community. You have a great trail system, like you talked about. You have many parks. But what are the hidden treasures that you think need to be promoted a little bit more or talked about a little bit more? And then on the flip side, do you have a favorite spot in the community that you can go to? <laughs> well, I've already identified my favorite spot. Just just kind of answering your last question first. I mean, it's the red. So for those who are system. looking for the counselor, they can go to the trail system and go find them. <laughs> yes, there. absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, we have we 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 have a we're a municipal. A city, uh, a municipality, pardon me. Uh, we have a provincial park within our borders. Uh, we have the Lois Hole Centennial Provincial Park, and it has uh, uh, it's a huge bird sanctuary, but also other other types of wildlife that you pretty much see any time of the day you're out there. We have, I mean, if you're a, if you are into uh, bird bird watching, we have over I think there's been 235 different types of bird species identified in within the big big lake. Um, so, I mean, uh, you have your choice of that, or you can kind of move a little bit more to the east and get into the Greenland's White Spruce Forest, which is something that we've just uh, developed in, in that sense, but we've kept it extremely na uh, natural um, and incorporated a number of the natural features. Uh, and I know we have many residents that go there daily just to interact uh, with uh, moose that live in the area. Uh, and other wildlife uh, that are within uh, meters of uh, actual residents. So those are those are the areas that I like. But you know what? If you want to keep moving further east, one of the areas that my wife and I enjoy as a hidden gem is the uh, Saint Albert Botanic Park, and it's got it's the uh, largest uh, rose garden in uh, one of the largest rose gardens in North America. So it's right along our trail system. So I uh, I really enjoy that, uh, and my wife really enjoys that because right around now there's uh, an abundance of uh, different types of uh, plants that are starting. I mean, when you you can see the real change of seasons in our river valley and through our parks. Um, so, and I've already spoken about the uh, outdoor farmers market, and I think yeah. that's really not a hidden gem anymore. <laughs> I think a lot of people know that. I think that um, I have. And I think a lot of people also know about our International Children's Festival that really is right downtown, right outside of St. Albert Place. And it's been going on for 40, well, three decades now, I think, somewhere in that level. And uh, it's one of the largest children's festivals in North America. And we attract um, artists and exhibits from all across the world now. Um, so, yeah, you it's know. Something for everything. Yeah, you know what? There is something for everything in relation to that. But you know, one of the things that we've just gotten, one of the things that I attended, uh, whether you call it sport tourism, I guess, we have a new BMX track that is rated as one of the top five in Canada. And uh, uh, believe me, with at my age, I'm not going to uh, take a BMX bike off of an eight meter uh, 
<laughs> jump. But uh, if you do, uh, can I film it for the show? Can I film no, that for the show, counselor? Only, only if you, only if you have an ambulance on standby, <laughs> because I think what it was just really amazing. Because I had no idea and no real, truly understanding in relation to the popularity of BMX not only in our community and uh, but all across Canada and certainly it raised got uh, a big uh, rise in prominence in relation to the recent Olympics and we have uh, a woman from uh, Red Deer who's a uh, uh, was finished fifth in the Olympics in her category and she was in St. Albert and just to see the structures and the setup and the parents and the engagement of kids whether they're four years old or actually going up to adults in their much later, I'm not even going to pick an age because it looked like there were some people about my age. And so uh, you see that. Plus, also, uh, you know, we've we've uh, we've got quite a number of good sports teams in relation to that. So, sport tourism is picking up in our community as well. So, there you go. So, I have two questions, two last questions before I let you go here. And my yeah, no uh, problem. The la- second question I was gonna, I'm not, I wasn't gonna ask, but uh, it's a new <laughs> segment. It's a new segment of the show, and it's only for people who are <laughs> about to enter "quote unquote" silly season in their provinces, oh, yeah. and, and that is election season. With an election a year away, have you made a decision if you're going to be putting your name back on the ballot for a third term, or have you come to the decision that you're going to step away, or have you made up your mind at all yet? Well, yeah, you know what I, you know, Bill Twenty sure threw a, a, a kind of a different vibe into this election, I think, and I'm, I think I'm one of those ones that are waiting to figure out what the regulations are going to be. But right now, I'm intending on on putting my name forward for my uh, third term. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, well, we're it's going to be really interesting. I mean, we just had uh, in our first council meeting, we've had a presentation by our legislative officer because of uh, recognizing some of the impacts that Bill 20 is going to have on the next election. Um, They need uh, another full-time, although temporary position that is going to assist with the election. Plus also we have, as I think you've identified this uh, another time, we have the added complexity, although who knows with the announcement yesterday of potentially having a federal election at the same time in Alberta as the municipal election. I hope that doesn't come to pass because, you know, we have to hire, can you work on a federal election at the same time as you work on a provincial municipal election? I, I doubt it. So there'll be challenges there in relation to that. So not that it impacts my decision, but it's going to impact. So, you know, in the past when we had tabulators, you pretty much knew within a couple hours whether or not you were successful or not. Now it's going to be three days. Oh, I'm, I'm having community. flashbacks. I'm having flashbacks <laughs> to like 1990 when I first covered my yeah. first election. This is going to yeah. be just so much fun. <laughs> Oh, it's not, you know, it's going to be so challenging for uh, for staff that are running elections. You know, it's going to be so much. It, it, it'll be a totally different experience. I mean, there's still going to be the 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 election, you know, and all of the, you know, uh, the stuff that relates to, again, taking the we out and putting the I back in and trying to deal with that. But then there's going to be, well, what do you do? What do you do for two and a half days or three days in relation to before they determine the results. So, I mean, that, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be other challenges that we haven't even thought of yet, but uh, we'll wait till the regulations come out. So my final question for you here, counselor, we started by talking about you. We're ending by talking about yourself, but also the city and it's a city question. In your Mm -hmm. opinion, what makes the city of St. Albert such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? I, I think I talked a little bit about it before in relation to that. Uh, we have so many um, services that uh, and service levels that our residents expect um, and enjoy. And yet we have uh, uh, so many opportunities and programs and places uh, that uh, are out there for our residents to explore. Um, You've identified the downtown. I've identified the Red Willow Trail. We are one of the 18 cities in the world. I designated as an official tree city. So we obviously care about our trees, our nature, our 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 nature spaces. But yet we are we do have we we do have uh, the type of housing. We do have the the community amenities that is required. 
So uh, you know what, but I'm going to get back to community. It's what it's it's such an important part of kind of why who I am and why I do what I do and why I like we just have a phenomenal community and we have so many residents that care about our uh care about their uh, the community and it just it you know what it marvels me all the time about what people are doing whether they're parents that are working at uh, a, a new school park or it's parents that are involved in uh, uh, all of our programming. Uh, it's parents that I see at our water park. It's parents that I see that are involved with uh, their kids in other in uh, in other um, cultural activities, whether you see them at the art and theater or in, in that. And so, or it's our seniors and how they get involved with everything going on. So I guess you know what every every probably counselor sees that in their community but I really see it in ours and it makes makes St. Albert such a special place for me and just always just always just makes it uh, this job so much more enjoyable than I think uh, I thought it would be. Counselor I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and talking about the city of St. Albert but also yourself. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's always impressive to learn and find out how passionate people are about their community. And in the last 45 mm -hmm. minutes, 50 minutes, I, I, I find that St. Albert's lucky to have you at their council table. So thank you so much for serving wow. and thank you so much well, for thanks. being a part of the show. Well, thank you again for the invitation. I, uh, I look forward to having the future conversations with yourself at other events. I think I saw you at FCM, you were bustling about and, I never. I meant to get introduce myself, and unfortunately, I just didn't have a chance to uh, do that. I was running uh, bodyguard for the, uh, for uh, our mayor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will see you in two weeks' time because this airs on yeah. Friday at Alberta Municipalities Conference yeah. in Red Deer. I'm looking forward to seeing being there and being yeah. on the ground and meeting some more municipal leaders. So, thank you so Great. much for doing this. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in for another great episode of Cross Border Interviews. Now, we truly hope you've enjoyed today's conversation with one of Canada's municipal leaders making a difference within their own communities. Now, if you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an upcoming episode. Your support helps us to continue to bring these important stories to light. So stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you next time here on Cross Border Interviews. Music